News of the Times. Whitechapel Wednesdays. The final episode. Welcome to our final episode of the series Whitechapel Wednesdays, recounting the scene, slayings, medical evidence and suspects through the newspaper publications of the time. In today's episode, we review the murders. Were these murders only defined to the canonical five as the police reported? The press did not think so. We take a look at the news reports regarding Whitechapel tragedies. We hope you enjoy the show. Recap In the previous episode, the horrific killing of Mary Jane Kelly was discovered creating absolute panic. In this, the final series, a suspect. From Sudelby's Ulverston Advertiser and General Intelligencer, 15th of November, 1888. Another Whitechapel murder. Terrible mutilation of a woman in Spitalfields. On Friday forenoon, the inhabitants of the East End of London were thrown into a state of consternation by the discovery in their midst of another revolting crime, far worse in its barbarity than any of the previous five murders which have shocked London during the past five months. The victim is again a woman of the impure class, and the murderer committed the crime under her own roof in broad daylight and easily escaped. Dorset Street, Spitalfield, is filled with lodging houses, tenanted chiefly by the lower classes, amongst them some of the most degraded thieves and immoral women. It was here that Annie Chapman, who was murdered in Hanbury Street on the 8th of September, lived, and by a strange coincidence the scene of the present crime is a court directly opposite the house to which that unfortunate woman was in the habit of resorting. Close by is Mitre Square, the scene of one of the murderers of September the 30th, and Hanbury Street is scarcely a stone's throw away. The victim of the crime of Friday is a young woman named Mary Jane Kelly, aged 26. She lived in Miller Court, Dorset Street, a turning out of Commercial Street, Spitalfields. There are eight or ten small houses in the court, which is entered by a low archway and a narrow passage from Dorset Street and forms a cul-de-sac. Here is a small general shop in Dorset Street adjoining the entrance to the court, tenanted by Mrs. McCarthy, who also owns the houses in the court. Kelly appears to have tenanted a room in one of Mrs. McCarthy's houses. She had a little boy aged about six or seven years living with her, and latterly she had been in narrow straits, so that she is reported to have stated to a companion that she would make away with herself, as she could not bear to see her boy starving. There are conflicting statements as to when the woman was last seen alive, but that upon which most reliance appears to be placed is that of a young woman, an associate of the deceased, who states that about half-past ten o'clock on Thursday night she met the murdered woman at the corner of Dorset Street. Kelly told her that she had no money, and if she could not get any, she would never go out again, but would do away with herself. Soon after they parted, a man who is described as respectably dressed came up and spoke to Kelly and offered her some money. The man then accompanied the woman home to her lodgings. A tailor named Lewis says he saw Kelly come out at about eight o'clock on Friday morning and go back. Another statement is to the effect that Kelly was in a public house known as Ringer's, at the corner of Dorset Street and Commercial Street, at about ten o'clock, and that she there met a man 
with whom she had been living. It seemed clear that the woman was alive at eight o'clock on Friday morning, that she went out for something and returned to the house. The murder must have been committed between that hour and a quarter to eleven o'clock. At the latter hour, Mrs. McCarthy, with her son, went to pay her customary visit for the rent. Young McCarthy sent a man named Boyer to the house, which, though entered from the court, is really a part of number 26, Dorset Street. Boyer failed to obtain an answer to his knocking, and looking through the window, he saw to his horror the woman lying on the bed, horribly mutilated and naked. He called McCarthy, who also looked through the window, and seeing that the body was cut up almost beyond recognition, he ran away with Boyer and ran to the Commercial Street Police Station, where they informed the police. Inspector Beck and Sergeant Betham proceeded to the house. The news had spread so rapidly that over 1,000 persons were gathered in the street. These were rapidly cleared away from the court and the side of Dorset Street whilst the inspector entered the house. The dwelling in which the murder was committed is entered by two doors situated on the right-hand side of a passage and has several rooms. The first door up to the court from the street leads to the upper rooms, but the second door opens only into one room, which is situated on the ground floor. It was in this room that the murder was committed. The fireplace faces the door, and the bed stands behind the door. A terrible sight presented itself to the police officers. The body of the woman in a state of nudity was stretched out on the little bedstead, the clothing of which was saturated with blood. The unfortunate woman has been cut and mangled by the assassin's knife in a manner which was revolting beyond all description. The fiend was not content with taking the life of his victim by severing the head from the body, but he had subjected her remains to the most frightful barbarities. The murder has aroused the greatest excitement in London, not only amongst the populace, but in the ranks of the police. Several persons have been arrested and released, and there is apparently little prospect of the discovery of the murderer. A proclamation has been issued by the authorities offering a pardon to any accomplice who will give information that will lead to the conviction of the miscreant who has committed the crime. An extraordinary scene was witnessed at ten o'clock on Sunday night in Commercial Street, not far from the scene of the murder. A man with a blackened face who styled himself Jack the Ripper was arrested. There was a cry of, Lynch him! And the man was beaten with sticks. He would have been seriously injured had not the police protected him. He refused to give his name, but asserted that he was a medical man. List of the East End Murders Several women have now been murdered in the East End and under mysterious circumstances, five of them within a period of eight weeks. The following are the dates of the crimes and the names of the victims as far as known. 1. Last Christmas week, an unknown woman found murdered near Osborne and Wentworth Streets in Whitechapel. 2. August 7th, Martha Turner found stabbed in 39 places on a landing in Model Dwellings, known as George Yard Buildings, Commercial Street, Spitalfields. 3. August the 31st, Mrs. Nichols murdered and mutilated in Bucks Row, Whitechapel. 4. September the 7th, Mrs. Chapman murdered and mutilated in Hanbury Street, Whitechapel. 5. September the 30th, 
Elizabeth Stride, found with her throat cut in Burners Street, Whitechapel. 6. September the 30th. Woman unknown, murdered and mutilated in Mitre Square, Oldgate. 7. November the 9th. Mary Jane Kelly, murdered and mutilated in a house in Miller Court, Dorset Street, Commercial Street, Spitalfields. The inquest on the body of the woman Kelly, who was murdered in Whitechapel on Friday, was held on Monday. The evidence threw no additional light whatever on the crime, and the formal verdict of willful murder against some persons unknown was recorded. At a late hour on Monday night, no person was under arrest in connection with the crime. From the Worcestershire Chronicle, 17th of November, 1888. Why bloodhounds were not used. The explanation given of why the bloodhounds were not used is that they would be of no use whatever in the locality in which the murder took place. Had it occurred in an open, unfrequented part, the dogs might have had some chance of success. There was a very widespread disappointment that bloodhounds had not been at once employed in the effort to track the criminal. The belief had prevailed throughout the district that the dogs were ready to be let loose at the first notice of a murder having been committed, and the public had come to possess greater confidence in their wonderful canine instincts and sagarity than in all Sir Charles Warren's machinery of detection. They even attributed the fact that more than a month had passed since the last revolting outrage to the fear which it was thought had been inspired by the intimation that these detectives of nature would be employed. They were not absolutely forgotten, but apparently were not at hand, and the conclusion was come to that the trail must inevitably have been destroyed long before they could have come upon the scene by the constant stream of persons to and from the narrow street. The validity of this objection has been called in question by experts, and it would certainly have given satisfaction to the public mind if an experiment had been made. A better opportunity than the present instance afforded could hardly have occurred. Previous Undiscovered Crimes in Whitechapel April the 3rd, Emma Elizabeth Smith, 45, had a stake or iron instrument thrust through her body near Osborne Street in Whitechapel. August the 7th, Martha Tabron, 35, stabbed in 39 places at George Yard Buildings, Commercial Street, Spitalfields. August 31st, Mary Ann Nichols, 47, her throat cut and body mutilated in Hanbury Street, Spitalfields. 30th of September, a woman supposed to be Elizabeth Stride, but not yet identified, discovered with her throat cut in Burner Street, Whitechapel. September the 30th, a woman unknown, found with her throat cut and body mutilated in Mitre Square, Aldgate. And November the 9th, Mary Jane Kelly, 24, her throat cut and body terribly mutilated in Miller's Court, Dorset Street. From the Globe on the 20th of November, 1888. More writing on the wall. The Press Association is informed by Arthur Backert, the young man who gave the police a description of a man seen in the neighbourhood of Berber Street at the time of the murder of Elizabeth Strive, that he was awakened at his home in Newnham Street yesterday by a policeman who called his attention to some chalk writing on the blank wall of the house as follows. Dear Boss, I am still about. Look out. Yours, Jack the Ripper. It is stated 
by Backert that the writing resembles that on the now famous postcard and letter published by the police, especially the B in Boss and the R in Ripper. A crowd collected and Mrs. Backert partly removed the cause of their attraction by washing out the letters, otherwise the police would have photographed the writing. The Toronto Daily Mail, the 21st of November, 1888. The same Tumblety. His arrest in London, not his first experience in that line. The New York Times says, The Dr. Tumblety, who was arrested in London a few days ago on suspicion of complicity in the Whitechapel murders, and who then proved innocent of that charge, was held for trial in the Central Criminal Court under the special law covering the offence disclosed in the late modern Babylon scandal, will be remembered by any number of Brooklynites and New Yorkers as Dr. Blackburn, the Indian herb doctor. He is the fellow who in 1861 burst upon the people of Brooklyn as a sort of modern Count of Monte Cristo. He was of a striking personal appearance, being considerably over six feet in height, of graceful and powerful build, with strongly marked features, beautiful clear complexion, a sweeping moustache, and jet black hair. He went dashing about the streets, mounted on a handsome light chestnut horse, and dressed in the costliest and most elaborate riding costumes, and soon had a stream of customers at his office and laboratory on Fulton Street near the City Hall. In these rides he was invariably accompanied by a valet, as handsomely apparelled and horsed as himself, and a brace of superb English greyhounds. He boarded with the Mrs. Foster at 93 Fullerton Street, then a fashionable quarter of the city, and cut a wide swathe in the affections of the feminine lodgers. After a few months he dropped out of sight as suddenly as he had appeared, and was next heard of being implicated in the famous fellow fever importation and black bag plots that the rebel sympathisers tried to develop in New York during the Civil War. It was at this time that his relation to the celebrated Blackburn family of Kentucky became known, and he therefore went by his real name instead of his curiously assumed names, Tumblety. His interest in the two previous mentioned plots was, luckily for him, so slight that he was allowed to go unpunished, while several of his associates did not get off so easily. For several years after this he kept pretty well out of the public gaze, and then suddenly took up his herb-doctoring business with its attended swagger again. He visited both this city and Brooklyn at about semi-yearly intervals and became a member of several questionable clubs. He dropped out of sight some ten years ago, and the first that had been heard of him since is the news of his arrest and imprisonment in London. From the Penny Illustrated Paper, the 24th of November, 1888. Fresh East End Outage. An outage at first magnified into a murder was committed last Wednesday morning in Whitechapel. At about four o'clock in the morning, a man and a woman named Farmer of the unfortunate class engaged a bed at a common lodging house in George Street, Spitalfields. The man suddenly made an attempt to cut his companion's throat. The woman, however, struggled with her all her might and screamed loudly for assistance. Her throat was only slightly wounded so that she was able to exert all her strength in coping with her assailant. He hastily fled from the house. Meanwhile, the screaming had attracted a few persons to the locality. These gave chase to the fugitive, but only for a short distance as the man disappeared somewhere, it is said in the direction of Heniage Street. The woman was placed on an ambulance by the police and conveyed to Commercial Street Station, the wound having been dressed 
she gave detailed descriptions of her assailant as follows. Age, about 30. Height, 5 foot 5 inches. With a fair moustache, wearing a black diagonal coat and a hard felt hat. The woman who was so fortunately escaped is between 40 and 50 years of age. Perhaps the most important point for the purposes of the identification was that the man had an abscess under his jaw. The woman declares that the same man accosted her 12 months ago. From the Western Mercury, the 3rd of November, 1888. Dr. Forbes Winslow's Opinion Dr. Forbes Winslow and other leading authorities on mental disorders are reputed to be still of the opinion that the murders in Whitechapel were committed by a homicidal lunatic and that Dr. Forbes Winslow believes that the murderer had been lately in, in a lucid interval in which conditions he would be completely rational and forgetful of what he had done. As soon as this passes off, he will resume his terrible work. Another threatening letter. By the last post on Tuesday night, a letter purporting to come from the East End assassin was received at the Poplar police station, in which the writer said he was going to commit three more murders. The following is said to be the wording. October the 30th, 1888. Dear Boss, I'm going to commit three more murders, two women and a child, and I shall take their hearts this time. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. The letter was enclosed in an envelope which, in addition to the popular postmark, also bore the Ealing postmark and was directed to the sergeant. A copy was sent to the Commissioner of Police. The information with instructions were at once telegraphed to the different stations, ordering every possible vigilance to be used in case of an attempted repetition of the crimes. From the Globe on the 26th of December, 1888. Is this the Whitechapel murderer? An extraordinary personage. A man calling himself Dr. Tumblety was arrested some time ago in London on suspicion of being concerned in the perpetration of the Whitechapel murders. The police, being unable to procure the necessary evidence against him in connection therewith, decided to hold him for trial for another offence against a statute which was passed shortly after the publication in the Pall Mall Gazette of the Maiden Tribute, and as a direct consequence thereof, Dr. Tumblety was committed for trial and liberated on bail two gentlemen coming forward to act as bondsmen in the amount of £300. The last scene of him was at Havre, and it is taken for granted that he has sailed for New York. The man is declared by the US papers to be well known for his eccentricities. William P. Burr of number 320 Broadway, speaking of the man, said, The English authorities who are now telegraphing for samples of his writing from San Francisco ought to get them in any city of Europe. I had a batch of letters sent by him to the young man Lion, and they were the most amusing farango of illiterate nonsense. He never failed to warn his correspondent against lewd women, and in doing it used the most shocking language. I did not know how he made his money. My own idea of the Whitechapel case is that it would be just a thing as Tumblety would be concerned with, but he might get one of his victims to do the work. For once he had a young man under his control, he seemed to be able to do anything with the victim. Colonel C. A. Dunham, a well-known lawyer who lives near Fairview, New Jersey, was intimately acquainted with Tumblety for many years, and in his own mind, 
had long connected him with the Whitechapel horrors. The man's real name, said the lawyer, is Tumulty, with Francis for a Christian name. I have here a book published by him a number of years ago describing some of his strange adventures and wonderful cures, all lies, of course, in which the name of Francis Tumblety, M.D., appears, when, to my knowledge of the man's history, his idiosyncrasies, his revolting practices, his antipathy to women, and especially to fallen women, his anatomical museum containing many specimens like those carved from the Whitechapel victims, when, to my knowledge on these subjects, there is added the fact of his arrest on suspicion of being the murderer, there appears to me nothing improbable in the suggestion that Tumblety is the culprit. He is not a doctor. A more errant charlatan and quack never fattened on the hopes and fears of afflicted humanity. I first made the fellow's acquaintance a few days after the first battle of Bull Run. The fellow was everywhere. I never saw anything so nearly approaching a bequity. Go where you would, to any of the hotels, to the War Department or the Navy Yard, you were sure to find the doctor. He had no business in either place, but there he went to impress the officers whom he would meet. He professed to have had an extensive experience in European hospitals and armies, and claimed to have diplomas from the foremost medical colleges of the old world and the new. At length it was whispered about that he was an adventurer. One day my lieutenant colonel and myself ex accepted the doctor's invitation to a late dinner, symposium he called it, at his rooms. He had very costly and tastefully furnished quarters in, I believe, H Street. Someone asked why he had not invited some women to his dinner. His face instantly became as black as a thundercloud. He had a, a pack of cards in his hand, but he laid them down and said, almost savagely, No, Colonel, I do not know any such cattle, and if I did... I would, as your friend, sooner give you a dose of quick poisoning than take you into such danger. He then broke into a homily on the sin and folly of dissipation, fiercely denounced all women, and especially fallen women. Then he invited us into his office, where he illustrated his lecture, so to speak. One side of this room was entirely occupied with cases outwardly resembling wardrobes. When the doors were opened, quite a museum was revealed. Tiers of shelves with glass jars and cases, some round and some square, filled with all sorts of anatomical specimens. The doctor placed on the table a dozen or more jars containing, as he said, the matrices of every class of woman. Nearly a half of one of these cases was occupied exclusively with these specimens. Not long after this, the doctor was in my rooms when my lieutenant colonel came in and commenced expatiating on the charms of a certain woman. In a moment, almost the doctor was lecturing him and denouncing women. When he asked why he hated women, he said that when... Quite a young man, he fell desperately in love with a pretty girl, rather his senior, who promised to reciprocate his affection. After a brief courtship, he married her. The honeymoon was not over when he noticed a disposition on the part of his wife to flirt with other men. He remonstrated, she kissed him, called him a dear jealous fool, and he believed her. Happening one day to pass in a cab through the worst part of the town, he saw his wife and a man enter a gloomy-looking house. Then he learned that before her marriage his wife had been an inmate of that and many similar houses. Then he gave up 
all womankind. She awfully, after telling the stories, the Doctor's real character became known, and he slipped away to St. Louis, where he was arrested for wearing the uniform of an army surgeon. Tumblety would do almost anything under heaven for notoriety, and although his notoriety in Washington was a kind to turn people from him, it brought some to him. From the St. James's Gazette, the 31st of December, 1888. The Whitechapel murderer search in America. Inspector Andrews of Scotland Yard, the Daily Telegraph's correspondent says, has arrived in New York from Montreal. He is generally believed that he has received orders from England to commence his search in this city for the Whitechapel murderer. Mr. Andrews is reported to have said that there are half a dozen English detectives, two clerks and one inspector employed in America in the same case. The supposed inaction of the Whitechapel murderer for a considerable period and the fact that a man suspected of knowing a good deal about this series of crimes left England for this side of the Atlantic three weeks ago has produced the impression that Jack the Ripper is in America. The direct news reports of the Whitechapel murders as the killings that would be attributed to Jack the Ripper within Whitechapel ceased as the particular slayings in the same style stopped within the Whitechapel vicinity. From here, the Whitechapel atrocities faded as other crimes took its place, yet the threat remained in the streets. As the months passed, the dread of another ripper killing lingered in the air, perpetuating a climate of unease and suspicion. The streets of Whitechapel, once teeming with life, became more desolate and haunted by the memory of those brutalised by the hand of a killer who eludes justice, at least temporarily. Historically, the Jack the Ripper case continues to baffle authorities and historians. The legacy of Jack the Ripper, a name etched in the annals of criminal history, will forever symbolise the dark underbelly of Victorian London and the enigma of an unsolved mystery that continues to send shivers down the spines of Londoners. That concludes this last episode of the series Whitechapel Wednesdays. We really hope you enjoyed the show. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload five days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in-depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. And Wednesdays will become Wicked Wednesdays. And in this series, we will be looking at some of the shocking events, bloody places and outrageous organisations of their day. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching 
or listening. This has been News at the Times, and I am Robin Coles.